are defines how you build. Thank you for welcoming me for your last uh, session of the quarter. Um, just before I start going through the presentation, uh, I would recommend you follow the wonderful team at Bolt Threads. Uh, I'm sorry if you have the misfortune of following me on Twitter. Uh, you'll mostly get rage tweets about the Seahawks games and things like that. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about the company I started after graduate school called Bolt Threads. Uh, but before I can get into what Bolt is and some of the things I've learned, I kind of have to give you a little view on how I view the world and, and why, why there's a, a problem that's worth solving here. So the planet we live on, Earth, about four and a little over four and a half billion years old. Uh, if we look at fossil records, uh, life has been on this planet for... I say 4 billion years is actually like 3.8 is the current estimate, but I always say what's 200 million years between friends. Um, and if you, uh, if you think about us homo sapiens, we've been here for about 200,000 of those years. We've got some ratio 23,000 to 1 up there. I actually like an analogy as a way to understand this a bit better. So if you say Earth is about one day old, humans are about 3.76 seconds old, um, and the decimal points really matter on this when you're talking about such a big ratio. And, and what astounds me is that in that time that we've been here on this planet, in two human lifetimes, 150 years, humans have had a dramatic impact on every aspect of this planet. Uh, climate change is the one that comes to mind, but whether it's changing, the, eco, changing the, uh, the hurricane season to be more intense, wildfire season as we experienced here just a week ago, uh, or covering the... Uh, the planet and pollution and uh, waste products, uh, we are having a big impact and we've done it incredibly quickly. And adding to that problem in the next, by the end of this century, uh, we're gonna add several billion more of us to the planet. This is baked into the pie, it's pretty much inevitable. Uh, and the truth is, a good chunk of those 11-ish billion people who are here are gonna become middle-class consumers. And that's good, no poverty, all sorts of good stuff. On the downside, they're gonna eat like middle-class consumers, buy stuff like middle-class consumers, and throw their crap away like middle-class consumers, uh, much like we do here in the United States. <laughs> and so the question a lot of people have to grapple with going forward is, can this planet support about three billion more middle-class consumers and about four billion more people uh, going forward? And uh, it's a good, honest question, and I think there's an there's a interesting thing we can think about here of some of the limitations of resources. So I'll use the, the, the arable land example. So right now, arable land, where we grow our food and we feed all of us, uh, it's great, it works. We've got about 5% more arable land that we can go uh, and add new crops to and grow uh, more food. But if you just take that population growth uh, and number of middle-class consumers and look at 2050, you need 70% more arable land. And unfortunately, this is not like adding servers to your cloud infrastructure. This is like land. We don't make more of it. You know, maybe someone will come up with a crazy idea, but uh, it seems a little, little far-fetched. So I actually want to ask you guys a question, you know, knowing this. How many of you, show of hands, are optimistic that humans will be here thriving 10,000 years from now? A couple of you. Okay, we'll make it a little easier. 1,000 years, hands. Anyone else? Okay, now the easier question, 100 years. Are we going to be here? All right, so everyone's pretty up. I, I, we'll be here in 100 years, right? Uh, I'm actually incredibly optimistic that we are smart enough to be here and thriving 10,000 years from now. And it's, it's, it's not because I have blind faith or I'm just a dreamer. Um, it's that uh, I'm trained as a scientist and I believe in the data. And I think there, that, that the example is there in front of us of what we harness to be smart enough to do this. Um, I believe in what we can measure and prove. And here's, here's what I always come back to. For that 3.8 billion years that life's been here, done okay. Like, we just screwed it up in the last 150. Like, look at all these things that, that, that biology has done. It pervades the planet, huge amount of diversity. I'm showing you what's called a phylogenetic tree here, but the idea that everything comes down to a common ancestor, which yet to be uh, uh, agreed upon. But everything from uh, your fungi and your animals to your filamentous and cyanobacteria, your photosynthesizers, there's a huge amount of diversity. And this all went along just fine for, you know, basically 3.8 billion years minus 150 uh, before we really came along with our, our modern society. And the thing I find amazing about biology, this is like, it, it it's almost reads as a sci-fi tech, uh, even something as boring as a flower. Uh, biology 
covers the planet in every possible range of ecosystems, from snowy and arctic to subtropical or desert. Uh, it self-reproduces. All of our modern products that we've learned to make, widgets, devices, your iPhone, if you chuck it in some sugar water, your iPhone doesn't reproduce, it just shorts out. Um, you throw a seed in the ground, it grows, it makes more seeds and it makes more stuff. It repairs. If I cut, uh, and I'll show an example of this later, if you cut something off uh, of a tree, it grows back. And, and can you imagine describing to someone, so I'm gonna show a short video here. And this is forest floor, nothing really happening. Oh, now it's moving a little bit. It's time lapse, not in real time. Uh, and look, something is growing out of the floor, growing to many times its height. It's then going to uh, sprout some flowers and look pretty and blow in the breeze. And if you describe this as a technology you were going to invent out of a uh, entry-level engineering class, people would tell you you're crazy. It can't be done. This CO2, sunlight, time, don't freeze. It works. That's absolutely amazing. Biology is powerful. And, and me, as a bioengineer, see this as an example of something that can we figure out how it works? Not just watch it and say, wow, that's pretty, but use it to solve some of the problems we have on this planet. And here's what's really changed a lot uh, in the last 15 years. And to the layperson who's not a biologist, it's been less obvious. And this is one of many things, ways to convey this. But uh, DNA sequencing is a really good uh, way to show how this technology has changed uh, dramatically. Um, you can talk of, this is, this is reading DNA technology. This is, you look at the A's, T's, C's, and G's within the genome of every living organism on the planet and understand how it stores information that makes it do everything from eat and digest things to make new versions of itself to self-repair. And as this cost has gone down from, you know, $100 million a genome to about 1000 bucks a genome, uh, it's enabled a lot more engineering capabilities, design, build, test cycles. And there's anal I can show you analogous data for writing DNA code, for synthesizing those A's, T's, C's, and G's, as well as some of the more esoteric tools and, and computational functionality that's critical there. And so I actually think modern, bioengin modern bioengineering is truly engineering and going there quickly. And it liberates us from the canonical ways we think about materials in particular uh, across our planet and energy so that we're not gonna be reliant on 18th century solutions to 21st century problems. And so, the one big problem here is that all of our modern economy is built on a absolutely amazing material that is fundamental to everything we do, and that's oil. Uh, and oil's amazing, I'll show you in the next slide when we get there, uh, it, it's, we kinda need it, but there's no amount of optimizing that current economy to sustainability for 10,000 years. Uh, we're either going to burn it all up, we're either gonna release enough greenhouse gases that we unleash the full uh, fury of climate change, uh, or we're gonna drown ourselves in pollution of things that never degrade. But as I said, it's actually quite useful. It's made some really awesome things. Uh, you know, everything from, you think about driving your cars and stuff like that, but uh, everything from paving roads to making plastics and, and over the last uh, 50 years, plastics unsurprisingly have grown dramatically because they're cheap, they last a long time, uh, and they're very good at what they do. Uh, in fact, you find them touching every element of your life, including, I'd be willing to bet 95% of you are wearing plastic fibers right now. Um, the challenge with that is that it's designed for a product that you use for a short time, but lasts a long time. And our future looks something like this. When you create something out of a polyester or a nylon or an acrylic plastic, you're putting something out there that you're gonna use for anywhere from, I don't know, drinking straw for a couple seconds to minutes, uh, and it's gonna last for a few hundred years. There's a big impedance mismatch between the, the material and the product and, and how long it lives. And that's actually only the part you see. Take your clothes. Two thirds of the fibers made on this planet every year come from plastics, primarily polyesters. Uh, we make and consume about 80 billion, I've heard it's about 100 billion now, garments per year across this planet. That is an insane number, and it's only gonna get worse. And those plastic fibers, when you, uh, when you look at your yoga pants, your t-shirts, your sneakers, uh, they're all there and they take hundreds of years to degrade. What's even worse, and our friends at Patagonia um, uh, paid for this study and we have a partnership with them, and give them a lot of credit for calling out something where they are part of the problem as well, and they know it. Uh, 
When you wash your garments that have polyester fibers in it, small microfibers, smaller than a millimeter, break off and go down the drain. And there, this data is showing you, it's like a per six kilogram wash load, how many, what the count is of those microfibers. Not only do they come off in the water, but they actually go slip through uh, all the way through the waste processing plant out into the ocean where they're eaten by uh, small organisms like plankton, which are eaten by fish, which are eaten by us. Um, and there was actually a great article that came out about two months ago quantifying the amount of plastic microfibers in poop of humans across every continent on this planet. And it's like 95% of us have it. And it's actually such a new problem, we don't even know if it's bad for us or not. Like, I, I think it is, but we don't know. We just kind of know the problems there now. But if you ask me, this seems kind of unsustainable, right? How do, we go fo how do we live on a planet where we consume 80 billion garments a year that effectively never go away? Whereas you turn around and look at how nature does things, and it makes materials that are designed for four billion years to biodegrade in the environment. And I found this one, I'd, I'd throw this up here just to point out the absurdity of some of the things we do. You know, fruit is great. There's a term that goes bad faster than fruit because fruit actually biodegrades. We've actually been so crazy as to make things like things that look like fruit out of plastic that will never go away. This is absolutely absurd. So I think, you know, nature's incredible. Uh, there's a problem here with materials. Nature solved a lot of these problems. Four billion years. That's a lot of like what exists today, but everything that came before it that we can find out there. Uh, and when, they, when nature makes a material, it stores it in the genetic code, like I kind of alluded to earlier. And so I'm going to give you an example here. One that I think is, drives the point home a little bit, show you a few things that nature makes. So this is a barnacle. I'll be surprised if none of you have seen one of these before, but maybe you haven't. Uh, they most, these little crustaceans, they, they, they stick to the hulls of ships and piers and things like that. And this is a blown up version here. They basically sit there in their filter feeders trying to eat stuff that comes by. Uh, have no brain, have effectively no way to move around except for in the early part of their life cycle. But they've essentially evolved and adapted over time a glue that they make and secrete that cures within salt water, which is actually a really rare feature. Um, and they stick to this ship and not even, you know, no hurricane, no amount of driving fast takes them off. You can come there with a hammer to bust them off. We as, as scientists, chemists, chemical engineers, we haven't made things as good as that in our hundred years of, of supposedly being the smartest in the world. Um, this next one I'll show you is a, it's another different material where nature's evolved something cool. Um, and I'll, I'll do this in two phases. One, because uh, I a gratuitous hummingbird video because I like hummingbirds. Um, so this hummingbird is flapping its wings 60 times a second. Uh, that is kind of crazy, right? Has anyone tried to move their arms 60 times a second? You, you, don't do it, you'll hurt yourself. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's absolutely amazing. So how did, how did nature solve this problem? And the better example to show you guys is, um, we'll take this dragonfly. It does the same thing, but it's a better understood system. So this dragonfly, fairly small, has wings that are about the length of its body, giant lever arms. I don't see big burly muscles to move its uh, wings 60 times a second. Um, and it is in, in her short lifespan, she'll flap her wings about 300 million times. Uh, what she's done is gone and evolved effectively protein-based rubber bands that sit in the joints of the wing that are 99% energy efficient. So she's not actually putting a lot of energy in, she's just kind of keeping them bouncing over time that, uh, that keeps her aloft. And that's absolutely incredible. It, we don't make rubber nearly that good anywhere on the planet from petrochemicals. So my, my personal favorite, where Bolt started, uh, the silk that spiders make. So what you're looking at here, it's a video I'm gonna show you. Um, this is called the Darwin bark spider. Um, she's about a gram, not the smartest critter in the world, uh, spins this protein-based fiber that we call silk. Um, it's very similar to the silk we use for apparel uh, over the years. Um, and it's fine, it's biodegradable. I'm gonna actually back up and play this again. Um, okay, it's fine, biodegradable. It's actually stronger or tougher than Kevlar uh, by about sevenfold. Uh, it's absolutely incredible material. She's not intelligent about it. She just had a 400 million year head start. Um, and so what she's doing here, actually, this is a really cool feature that spiders do. Uh, this is called uh, ballooning. She's releasing this silk. It's wafting across a river. It's gonna catch on the other side. It's about 30 meters wide. And she's gonna build a web over that river to catch bugs that come up to make more baby spiders. Um, and that, that's the power. That's one of the most powerful things you can imagine on the planet when you look at biology. 
And it actually gets far better than that because this silk is actually out of one of six or seven kinds, depends on the species that she makes, that have different features. One, stretchy like spandex. Another, you think of a spider's web, it's sticky. Um, this, that silk is not sticky. She actually makes a glue from a different gland that she coats onto those fibers. There's another one that's super soft. There's one that's um, uh, very, very fine. Uh, but all in, she's already provided a roadmap for how you would make a wide array of fiber-based polymers. Um, and so I think about you know, the technology that makes these guys tick. Um, they, they make our modern devices look like rocks that we carry around and talk into. Like, this is amazing with everything that they can do. Uh, and spiders are really where the Bolt story uh, started. So uh, we came along and said, you know what? There's a lot of these features out in nature. They're often made from proteins, much like the fiber we have here uh, from the spiders, the glue the barnacles make, the, the rubber in the, the insect wings, all incredible materials, all made from proteins. And proteins are kind of the core competency of biology. Uh, when you study biology, there's something called the central dogma. It's about information stored in DNA to functionality largely in proteins. Uh, the search space is about basically 20 to the N is the number of amino acids you have in there. So it's effectively, quickly becomes effect, uh, basically infinite. So I founded Bolt Threads in 2009 with two of my buddies uh, out of graduate school with the idea of using proteins to replace the plastics and other materials we find out there in the environment. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we do that uh, before I talk about some of the things we learned uh, along the way. So step one, everything's stored in DNA. Find, where, from, find the information you want and copy it out. And I no longer get to do this because I've been able to find people much smarter than me who work at Bolt, um, uh, probably many of your colleagues over the years uh, who come and work with us. So Rena here uh, kind of typifies what happens in a biology lab, ranging from finding the information in uh, an organism, doing a little bit of uh, tweaking and coding to make it work better in a new organism. We use yeast, that's actually what she's looking at here on these plates, single-celled organism. Actually, we as humans have a very long and uh, passionate love affair with yeast. Uh, for uh, several thousand years, we've used it to make cheese, bread, beer, wine, things we love uh, all over the world. Um, and then we have essentially yeast that are tuned to make the spider silk protein without any spiders. Um, then we need to make a lot of it. Turns out that growing scale up is always a thing for startups. Um, growing a lot of these plates is a real bad idea. Um, so we turn to another yeast kind of technology called fermentation, where we use large stainless steel tanks. And there was a time when I used to say this was a giant 300 liter stainless steel tank. Now in bolt parlance, this is a baby little fermenter that's cute and we run it around our place. Um, normally when we're doing scale up now, these things are about 20 feet in diameter, about six stories tall. And that's where we mass produce metric ton scale quantities of spider silk protein. Then, and I'm not gonna show it here because it's kind of distracting, but we take it, take the protein, make it into a powder, much like a, a powdered milk or a whey protein, like after a workout, um, uh, dissolve it into a viscous liquid and extrude it like you'd make rayon or polyester into fibers. And one of the things we've learned over the years is that uh, if you give people a pile of polymer or a pile of fiber, they don't really know how to interpret it. So you make things that people actually interact with. So uh, in about a year ago, uh, we did this, it was a, a limited edition drop. This is a, a wool spider silk blend, 60% uh, wool, 40% spider silk that we did in combination with a, a, a friends of ours at Best Made Company. Uh, and it basically makes this beautiful soft yarn that we knit into a product that actually turns out to be about 30% warmer than wool by itself, um, while being about 10% lighter. Um, and so we made this, we made it in a product, and we actually took it all the way. This was the idea of getting minimum viable product all the way in the hands of consumers. Uh, by making something, putting it in a FedEx box, and showing up at a doorstep. Turns out, the hardest part of the whole thing, getting through customs in Russia. <laughs> uh, another example, so uh, we work with the designer Stella McCartney, um, and in um, early last year, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York commissioned a piece for, for an exhibit they were doing, uh, where Stella designed this dress, and then we came along and uh, made it out of 100% spider silk, and the museum displays it as a piece of art for about six months uh, before now. I think it's probably gonna end up on display in one of Stella's shops at some point. But absolutely incredible. And what it does is it starts to ignite the imagination of what can be, and that this can become real product. That it's not just a science experiment, 
that it's going to turn into things people can interact with and buy. And as we continue going forward, um, the, the mantra is scale. You're going to see this in a lot more places um, starting next year and beyond. Um, so the good news about this, it kind of sounds sci-fi, like Tom said in the beginning. It sounds like you're venturing into the unknown and that you're going to you know, try and launch, a, put a man on the moon for the first time or do something absolutely crazy. And it is a bit crazy. It's, I won't deny that, but we're following a playbook that's been optimized over billions of years. You're copying something that already exists. So when I look at this, the beauty of biology and the four billion years of evolution to, to use as your crib notes is that you get two big advantages that other product developers, chemists, and others before you never had. And this should never go understated. You have a working prototype in your hands. Like I can, well, not right now, it's too cold. The spiders are all dead. Um, but uh, it's Charlotte's Web, fall, whole thing. Um, but we can go out there when there's spiders and webs. We can take a piece of the silk, we can put it in a mechanical tester, and we can test those properties, right? There is a working, functional, 3D composition of matter that works for this stuff. So like, you know that. And second, you know that biology can manufacture it. So if you can engineer biology, you too can manufacture it. What that small caveat there is it doesn't tell you how hard and how long it's gonna be, how many millions of dollars it's gonna take, but it can be done. And, and I, I would uh, venture to say that that is a massive cheat when you're going off and starting uh, something new. So we have another product we announced earlier this year that I'll talk about briefly. Um, a problem material on the planet for sustainability. This is one that actually is from nature. Leather, everybody loves leather. Who doesn't love leather? Uh, there's some reasons not to love leather. I'll, I'll cut to the chase there. But uh, a wonderful material has evolved effect effectively with humans over the years. Um, I love a, a leather jacket as much as the next guy, uh, although it has some problems. Uh, I'm not a vegan. But from a sustainable materials point of view, besides just killing a cow, that is a really inefficient way to make that material. You could do far better. So if I have a jacket like this, raising the cow to make the, le make the hide to make the leather is a three-year process. Um, the economics of, of uh, leather, are, are of the hides, is absolutely terrible. It's actually considered a waste product. And during that three years, that cow is taking up pasture space. Um, it's eating a couple tons of grasses that are using water and land and all sorts of stuff. Um, cows are expelling greenhouse gases in the form of methane from their belches, which is about 20-ish, 25 times more potent than um, CO2 alone. And it's essentially fueling global warming. Let alone, once you have the hide of a dead cow, uh, you have to go through a tanning process to do what's called deputrification. It's the word of the day. Um, <clears throat> and Tanning hasn't changed much in the last 600 years. Some of them look a little nicer than this. We used to do a lot of uh, uh, hide tanning in the US. It's terrible. Toxic chemicals, lots of salt, smells awful. Um, and so what we've essentially done in the US is export all of this pollution to other parts of the world that look something like this. And there are fancier versions, but largely that. So when I look at it from a renewable resources point of view, uh, what you have is a 600-year-old solution that just makes no sense. So at Bolt, we actually announced earlier this year uh, where that we're making uh, a leather product. And I've got one that you guys can touch up here if you want. And this is, um, this is a leather. It looks like leather, feels like leather, but it's made from growing mushrooms. Um, so we grow, um, you take a mushroom, and it's uh, the part you eat is called the fruiting body. Most of the organism grows in a dense network of roots called mycelia. We grow these mycelia on waste products, actually from the silk process, um, and create a leather that grows in nine days, not three years, and eliminates all of the harmful chemistries in the tanning process. It's durable, it's functional, no animal involved. And mushrooms are kind of, kind of fascinating, right? These are things that grow on uh, waste products like cellulosic biomass. They're some of the biggest organisms on the planet. Um, I find this actually pretty incredible. If you go, you can actually take a road trip up to Oregon and see this, you know, 2,000 acre single organism. You know, pop quiz trivia for pub night is the uh, largest organism on the planet. It's not a blue whale, it's a fungus. Um, and so what we do is actually is grow it in a tray. So this is essentially wood chips or manure or something like that. Uh, the corn stover is what we use uh, in particular. Uh, and then what happens is this mycelium, the fine root structure, we trick it and it grows above the air. Uh, we create a, create a foam uh, in about nine days, and then we use that to uh, compress it, cook it, dye it, and you get something that looks like this. Looks like cow leather, 
but like the silk, is a completely circular material. Comes from products from nature, can be redigested by uh, natural processes across ecosystems on the planet. Uh, and that's pretty incredible. And at Bolt, we have a whole series of new things that will come after this. And so um, these two are just the beginning of what we're doing. Uh, we were really started as three science-obsessed nerds who were driven to avoid getting full-time jobs when we were going to graduate. Uh, and what we've evolved into is a company looking to solve some of the most vexing material science problems on the planet. And the, the best news of this whole thing, in my opinion, is you don't actually have to trust me. You have to look at a working functioning system that's been here for four billion years and trust that track record. And so far, we only have nine years of experience. Uh, but I'm going to go into a short section where I talk about uh, some of the things we've learned about reinventing a category. So Bolt's a weird company. We blend consumer meets molecular biology. and Effectively, no one else on the planet really does that. So here's a couple of things I've learned. One, and this, is, this seems dumb and it, it feels a little, um, or maybe even overused, but everyone forgets it, um, that when you're starting a startup, I think the most important thing you can decide on as early as possible is what I would call, what's your North Star? And, and that's to say, what's the thing you want more than anything that you're willing to sacrifice on other things to get there? A really, really smart person in, in startup land once told me that the true strategy is the things you decide not to do, not the things you decide to do. Because it's easy to say yes to a lot of things. It's hard to say no and give up the things you, that, come, that come with it. So first and foremost, simple point, but absolutely pivotal. And at Bolt, for us, it's, uh, it's actually uh, about our mission-driven nature. Uh, most people join Bolt because of the, the, the ability to take amazing new technology in an exciting new commercial space and do some real good in the world if we make it work. And so we, we actually reduce that down to a little, uh, little slogan we have that we're inspired by nature, devoted to science, and driven by an optimism that the best days of the planet remain ahead of us. And that, that's something that everyone who comes to Bolt really buys into. Uh, and it makes it easy to say no to all the other things uh, along the way because we know what we're saying yes to. Uh, the second uh, thing I'll point out is about recognizing opportunities. I, I think oftentimes people think that like opportunities are either they have to be completely obvious or that people get lucky. Uh, I would say that each of you are smart enough. You know amazing opportunities and it's all about the execution to get there. And so I'm going to show you, this is a vintage 2011 bolt threads, then called refactored materials, uh, Series A pitch slide. We raised $5 million uh, in our Series A back then. Um, and it was about the benefits of why you'd want to make silk this way. Uh, and we're mostly wrong, but whatever. Um, the, the idea here is that you can make, with an uh, uh, automated process, you make more consistent fibers than when nature makes them. Uh, you can control cross-section. Uh, we, we thought, and we, we were know, now know, you can make these fibers machine washable. And then I added these two things. I was like, people should care about this. Sustainability and the fact that they don't come from animals. I got laugh, like literally laughed out of venture capital pitches because of this, right? They were like, like, I might be as green as the next guy, but I've never heard of a vegan material. Today, there's like a billion dollars of demand coming to the Bolt's door asking for these things, and no one cares about these things. So the, we, the point here is not that like venture capitalists were dumb, it's that there was an opportunity, it just wasn't clear that the market and the need had all lined up in a way that everyone understood it yet. And that, that we had the right idea, just the right timing, and that by being flexible and knowing that there was an opportunity there, we were able to harness that later on. Uh, the second part of this was, where do you use silk? Um, and so my slides are a little backwards here, but I'll, uh, the way I'll explain this is, uh, if I, when I tell people we're making spider silk, uh, the first thing they say is make bulletproof vests. And it's probably because I seeded it in your mind by comparing it to Kevlar and being tougher earlier. Turns out, that's probably a terrible idea. You're taking a business risk on a, a market space application that literally no one's ever done with that material before, and so you're compounding risk upon risk that's serial. Whereas if you look back for about five centuries, uh, or sorry, five millennia, sorry, uh, silk's been used as a beloved material in consumer products and apparel. It doesn't have the long timeline and technical and regulatory risks that come with some of the other uh, spaces. And it simply required us as a bunch of engineers to kind of check our egos at the door and say, this isn't what feels like the most technical application out of the gate, but 
Turns out Silk's about a $5 billion a year market, which is not really what we go after right now. Uh, silk fiber itself, we go after other stuff within the fibers market. But there, and as you dig into it, there were really interesting technical problems to solve and really interesting sustainability problems to solve. Um, and then after we solve that, we can always come back and do these other crazy things people asked us to do, like make uh, uh, semiconductor dielectrics, uh, sailboat sails, medical devices, uh, beauty, and automotive. Nothing stops us from doing that in the future if we get the business right in the beginning. The other part I'll point out is uh, Milo. So uh, a year ago, this was not really a big part of Bolt at all. And it was a recognition that there was a massive opportunity in the market here, that the right technology at the right time with our team could be huge. And today, the demand is, I actually have stopped taking calls on Milo um, because uh, it, 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 the demand is just through the roof and people will pay anything for it. Um, this one is a little self-serving because I'm a scientist, but I would argue that treat entrepreneurship like science. Make sure you're learning from everything you do. Every, everything you do can be designed to learn something uh, as a failure, even in failure. Um, and so I would give a couple basic examples. I think of, uh, I've got a four-year-old son and a little past blocks and holes, but um, uh, trying things. Actually ask the question, gather the data, analyze it, and use that to inform your decisions. Running off of other people's wisdom and instinct is rarely the right option. And usually you can design good experiments that allow you to make data-driven decisions uh, on how to build your company and how to go forward. Um, I'll skip over this one. Competition. So uh, when you kind of lay Bolt out there, in the world of startups. Uh, you could think about what exists with similar materials. You've got your natural materials, your synthetic, and if we think about it, the bioengineered. And we're not the only ones who've thought of this idea of using biology to engineer materials. In fact, if you go start Googling around, you'll kick up companies like these ones. Um, and you'll say, oh, they're your competition. You could like fight them and block them with IP and like all these other things. Uh, and they've got like pretty pictures, kind of like ours. And like maybe this is a well, this is this is all our stuff over here. But maybe this is a problem, right? The reality is most startups don't die because you have competitors. Like we're all a bunch of startups who are burning cash and trying to like figure it out. The biggest competitor is ourselves. <laughs> the most likely chance a comp a startup fails, in my opinion, is the team makes bad decisions and runs out of money and can't make payroll. And so, and it, it just, it, you, that's like the most obvious thing, but everyone forgets it. Um, so like, I often advise everyone at Bolt, look internal, not external, for where the, wor the worst competition is. And make sure that we're testing the right things and being prudent with our path forward so that we can make our product and our technology real. Um, uh, turning a technology into a business. So this is a tricky one, especially for scientists and engineers. Um, you know, we're all good with technology. At some point, you have to find a way, may, way to make money doing it. Um, the Dan, just go raise more money answer only works for so long. Even though I've heard people say that at Bolt, Dan will just raise more money. Um, and so, so you know, the, the question here is like, I, I would argue that, that Netflix did this brilliantly uh, of finding a way to take a technology and marry it with a business model in a way to devastating effect to the rest of the marketplace. Uh, and so when we look at this at Bolt, uh, we have a business model that, in the traditional sense, what, what many people told us to do was uh, Bolt makes stuff, and then we give it to someone who's like a middleman who makes things like fabrics and materials, and then they'll sell it to brands, and you'll monetize by basically feeding the pipeline, and these people will eventually pull. That turns out to be terrible, and there's a million reasons that doesn't work, and there's no incentive. Great technologies die all the time here. So what we did at Bolt was kind of hybridize the business model, where not only do we make things, we take it all the way to the consumer, like that hat I showed you, uh, we made a series of neckties. We actually, like this, this bag actually we had on Kickstarter a little while ago. Um, a few examples here of stuff we've done. And like I said earlier about being a scientist, these are all experiments. We design these to learn a lot in everything we do from how do you design packaging, how do you ship something to what archetype of customer is interested in following us, how does it map across social media space and, uh, yeah, and e-commerce. And it's all about getting out there and doing lots of tests really, really quickly. Um, I often tell people within the company that humans are worse than random at predicting the future, but we are far better at seeing it and recognizing it. And so let's just make a lot of things and let's recognize where it's working. Um, 
what you should care about. This is a little nebulous, but if you start a startup, this is what the headlines are going to tell you you should care about. So these are some things that were written about bull threats. Um, it's all about dollars, right? Everyone cares about money. No one cares about the rest of it in public perception. But much like that North Star argument I made in the beginning, you, you need to know what you're going for and learn to ignore this, and it's harder than you think. It's really difficult. Everyone gets caught up in this. Raising money, financing, because we all understand money and the fungibility and being able to, uh, to, to do things with that. Um, but in reality, like, it all comes back to this. Like, we, we, we care about this internally, and if we do this right, all of the capital, all of the money will be there. Um, and the last thing, and this is just small, um, as an entrepreneur, no one is going to tell you how to do your job better than yourself. And the great entrepreneurs, in my opinion, find a way to self-motivate. Uh, for myself, it's how you cause enough anxiety, enough um, motivation to channel all of your energy into making the business go forward. So the example here is, um, you know, if you put yourself in a boring office situation every day, it's pretty hard to motivate yourself to do extreme things, to make risk-based decisions. Because, you know, uh, Bolt, no amount, uh, or day one at your startup, no amount of cutting costs will get you to profitability. You're going to have to make risky decisions and take chances to get there, um, which I imagine if I was hanging upside down on a, on a rock like this, uh, you're pretty motivated to make some risky decisions if you have to. Um, so those are the, a handful of things I've learned. I'd actually like to take some of your questions now uh, about what we've done at Bolt, how we've gotten here, and where we're going next. Right here in the middle. The leather suitcase, the not real leather suitcase you're making that's comparable, what is the cost analysis on that to a comparable leather product? And how is the market reacting to it on that basis? Because I've never heard of it before today. Mm -hmm. You say you're getting a lot of calls. Yep. So the... the, the for the people who are watching the, the video. Uh, how does the cost compare on the, the leather product today? And, and how does that drive market reaction? So our biggest problem by far today, Bolt's been around for eight years, is how much stuff we make, right? We've made 500 square feet total of that stuff probably, so it's not ubiquitous. We've made maybe 100 kilograms of fiber total. Now, next year, we're gonna go up 100x in leather and 10x in fiber or more. Um, what happens, and by taking stuff to market, what I have learned, the people who would buy from some of your customers and partners are the most attuned to the new stuff coming out. So if I launch 100 hats through Best Made or 200 briefcases or, or ba tote bags through Kickstarter, the people who are designing and making purchasing decisions at the large partner companies are the most attuned to the news that comes out around that. And modern, you know, uh, uh, modern advertising can be used for good or ill. Um, and if you have something that's new, exciting, and has a great story behind it, you can broadcast your message further than you ever could two decades ago. And so that, hey, the, uh, to answer your cost question, it's cost comparable will be less than leather at, at, at scale. Um, that's, I mean, you're, you're feeding it dead plant mat, ground up trees, uh, or horse manure, or stuff like that. It's, you're feeding it free stuff. Why does leather even exist anymore? Because we're not at scale yet. Because we're not at scale yet before we displace it. Yeah. It's about a $100 billion market, and it just needs time. Right here. So what's your main obstacle to scale? What's my main obstacle to scale? No one's ever scaled advanced biotech processes in this way before. Um, so if you take about, I'll give you a, a quick example of the silk problem. In silk, we have to develop a brand new process to do fermentation of this modified yeast and, and purify out the polymer. And all that does is buy you table stakes to then use your pure polymer to figure out a, a new fiber spinning process that takes some tweaks as well. And it just takes time to work through. It's, it's, people ask this in investment all the time. And it, it, when you break it down, it's very mundane things. It's like, oh, you're waiting for that widget to show up from you know, Argentina where they're making it or whatever it is. Uh, but it, it, with time, we're growing at about 10x per year right now in volume. And we will for several years to come. Uh, right here. Hi. Um, how are your products durable while still being biodegradable? Uh, so how are the products durable while still being biodegradable? Oftentimes in the beginning, they're, they're biodegradable but not durable. Um, but biodegradability is not about uh, it, it goes away instantly, but that it does go away in less than hundreds of years. So like often with our silks, you're looking at something that if you were doing a bunch of biodegrading tests right now, it's proportional to the density of the material and how enzymes and things like that and microorganisms can infiltrate if you bury it in nature. But your closet is not the optimal 
biodegradable environment compared to a compost heap. And so you can, you can tune in that way. And we shoot for something that lasts for roughly impedance match with how long you'd keep the, the piece of apparel. So most humans, you buy a piece of clothing, you wear it for, uh, I think industry, stand, industry would say 50 washes, so 50 wears. Almost no one goes that long anymore. But we basically have this idea of like, if it lasts for five to 10 years, that's way better than hundreds and uh, long enough to last for the product life sp lifespan. Who else? Uh, back there. So the, the fashion industry is kind of known for its, let's call it uh, ethical issues. <laughs> um, do you see in the future, you know, replacing that or ensuring that the materials that go into it are uh, more healthy for the planet? So uh, fashion's ethically challenged in a number of fronts. Do we envision replacing the fashion industry or changing the inputs to make it more sustainable with the planet? Um, my thesis, right now, you need to change, if you want to change the output with plastic, change the inputs of the material, because recycling, I'm a chemist, I'm biased in this, recycling is a terrible technology. It's just super lossy, uh, and you end up with this distributed pollution all over the planet. Um, so I think step one is that. Step two is, um, one of the things, and we don't talk about this a whole lot externally, but we actively look for materials that could change the way you manufacture the product, because then maybe you could dramatically change some of the other impacts in the industry. And that we're, it's still early in that. We're mostly focused on the longevity of the, waste, of the product and the waste product, um, but we've got some ideas kicking through. So it's a little bit of both, uh, right here. Do they smell? Do they smell? Um, well, actually, the leather smells like almost nothing. You guys can come smell it if you want. We actually may end up adding a scent in the end. Um, if you don't do it right, it smells awful. Um, like, so if you don't, if you don't, the like, uh, same way that if you took a hide and you didn't uh, um, properly preserve it, it rots. The same thing happens with all natural materials. So you actually have to go through this process of preserving it so that it does last for a long time. But odor is oftentimes a byproduct of degradation by microorganism. Uh, in the back here. Um. So you mentioned as like part of your inspiration that you want to like disrupt middle class consumers and their consumption of like polyester. But you're partnering with Stella McCartney and your like hats and your first products weren't exactly affordable to the middle class yep. industry. So how do you plan on like getting into that group and would you consider like selling your threads to bigger companies that are already part of that middle class consumer? Yep. So the, the question is, there's a vast mismatch between the scale we've done today and if you actually want to make a difference at a global scale. And, and, and yes, we, we, you know, part of this is the healthy tension that comes up in startups between the perfect solution and where you start. And my philosophy is always just start. Just start doing things and improving. And so uh, you know, my metric internal for Bolt is every, and some, it's a somewhat arbitrary scale. Everything we do, do it 2x better than the last time we did it. Because if we do that, we'll get there. And, and the, the long-term goal is exactly that. We would love for the fiber we make right now to be a ubiquitous, every brand on the planet's using it and has replaced it as the cost comes down and the scale goes up. But it comes back down to the, the slowness of scale of making actual physical things. Uh, I'm putting plants in place. Um, here. Um, I would label uh, bot thread as a deep, uh, deep tech uh, startup. Like, because uh, venture capitalists are taking technical risks in investing you, but now they say that uh, it's really time to be uh, to, for for bringing up a new um, hundred billion deep tech company. Will you be the next hundred billion deep tech company? So, so deep tech is popular. It's been a popular buzzword recently, and and, and will Bolt be the next one that is a hundred billion dollar plus company? Um, I don't know if we will be. Certainly, if you look at the basic ingredients. You can put together a functional model when you look at the market sizes and the TAM and all the important stuff you care about and where margin can be. There's no reason Bolt couldn't be a trillion dollar market cap company one day for the volume of stuff that's done. But you are taking real technical, like not even just technical risk, you're taking science risk. This is actually not even engineering risk in startup parlance. This is like, does the world work like we think it does so that we can actually bring this uh, to market? I, I'm hugely optimistic, I'm hugely biased. Because, what? Yes, I think that I think this this should, uh, well. Okay, I hope that happens. I actually hope our competitors do stunningly well as uh, also because when you look at the the need to make a change on the sustainability of this planet, it has to happen on a time scale that no one company can do itself. It, I mean, you'd have to mobilize in some insane way for Bolt. If Bolt's the only answer, I'm terrified. 
for the future. Um, so I hope a lot of people do this really well. And actually, I, I, I put my money where my mouth is there. I actually actively help anyone who's working in this space, whether I'm advising, uh, opening up resources we have at Bolt to teach people how to do things. There's a lot of things we've learned that, that we should be sharing. Right here. Why do you just produce these products, knee ties and hops? Why specifically? So how do we, so the question is, how do we choose these products and specifically to make them? Um, Again, it was the, we put ourselves in this uncomfortable position of saying, we're going to launch something. So we did neckties. Uh, it was the first product we ever did. It was a knit tie. We did it at South by Southwest in, um, it was 2017. It was uh, March 2017. And in December, I went to the team and said, okay, my South by Southwest panel got approved. Two thumbs up. Aren't you excited? Yay, clap, clap, clap. Guess what? We're going to launch our first product there. Silence. Like there was literally nothing done at that point. And so I left it, what I did is I, I put the challenge out there and I left it to the team and they did effectively something similar to an agile process where there was a three month sprint to figure out what it was, what we could make, what we could scale, what we could produce and put it out there. Because the point was, you know, nothing infuriates me more about tech companies than vaporware where it's like, oh, it's coming, it's gonna be perfect, it's gonna be great. And then the perfect becomes the enemy of good enough and ever making progress. For us, it's like pick stuff, put it out there, learn from it, move on. Right, uh, I had a picture here. We made some composite knife handles. It was kind of cool. We learned a lot about getting bubbles out and wetting the polymer with uh, epoxies and different resins. We made about 25 of them. We'll probably never, we may or may not do that again, but we learned a lot doing it about how you'd make a different type of product with the material and find out where the killer application is. And you do that by repetition. One more question. All right, last question. Who's got, who's got the last question here? Takers, takers. Right here again. Why did you buy in 2017 uh, Best uh, Made? So uh, this company, Best Made the company that we worked with, um, we acquired in 2017. Part of that was, again, it was a learning. And it's, I believe that when you make new materials with wild new material properties, we've learned that no one knows what to do with them. And so we wanted to have the agency to take it all the way to the consumer and see what happens. And we've done uh, we did one product last year with the hats. We've done about three or four this year. Um, and we will continue to ramp that up. And it's made us really smart about not only how our products work in the world, but also how uh, the current standard in the market is for direct-to-consumer. Because these are two things that normally don't exist together. Molecular biology, direct-to-consumer retail, and everything in between. And at least now, if we fail at it, we can say we have our, it was our fault the whole way through.